Hello and welcome to Living History UK and today we're going to take a closer look at gas warfare during the Great War. So the history of chemical and biological warfare isn't strictly confined to the Great War. It actually dates back, as far as we've been able to find, to 600 BC, when the Athenians, during a siege, actually tainted a water supply with poisonous plants. And, more recently, in 1845, the French in Algeria gathered a number of locals in a cave system, set fires and choked them to death with smoke. So the first international agreement signed between two countries agreeing to not use chemical and biological weapons was, ironically enough, France and Germany in 1675 when they signed the Strasbourg Agreement and specifically they outlawed the use of poisonous bullets. The first use of gas during the First World War was on the Western Front by the French in August 1914 who unleashed tear gas grenades on the Germans. The first large-scale use of gas came on the Eastern Front in January 1915, where the Germans fired approximately 18,000 shells on Russian positions west of Warsaw. These shells contained tear gas, but they failed to achieve the desired effect. When the First World War began in 1914, it was a mobile war, and there were two notable actions, one being at Mons, and the other being the push-up to the Marne. After the Battle of the Marne, it was then the race to the sea. The British Army then found itself in a city called Ypres. This was an important city. One, because most of Belgium had been already taken. So politically, if that city had fallen, it wouldn't have done very well for the Belgians and it wouldn't have looked good for us either and it, could have, and it would have cut us off from the French. And with that, by the autumn of 1914 would be the first Battle of Ypres or what become known to the lads as the first Battle of Wipers. So during the Great War there was three main gases which we can identify which were used. The first being chlorine and that mainly affects the eyes but moreover the respiratory system. Secondly we have a gas called phosgene. This was six times more deadlier than chlorine and was responsible for a total of 85% of all gas related casualties during the Great War. And the third and final gas which was used, which many of you I'm sure will be familiar with, is mustard gas and that's mainly a blistering agent. But it would be chlorine gas which was the first proper gas which was used against the Canadians and British troops and French troops at the Second Battle of Wipers. In early May 1915, the Germans unleashed chlorine gas, which drifted towards the British at Hill 60, southeast of Wipers. The ill prepared British suffered greatly as a result, and the effects of chlorine gas were not surprisingly unpleasant, as Private W. Hay of the Royal Scots wrote We knew there was something was wrong. We started to march towards Wipers, but we couldn't get past on the road with refugees coming down the road. We went along the railway lines to Wipers and there was their people, civilians and soldiers lying on the roadside in a terrible state. We heard them say it was gas, but we didn't know what the hell gas was. When we got to Wipers, we found a lot of Canadians lying there dead from gas the day before. Poor devils. And it was quite a horrible sight for us young men. I was only 20. So it's quite traumatic, and I've never forgotten, nor ever will forget it. When the Allies first encountered poison gas, there was very little they could actually do about it. The best they could do was just hold their breath, close their eyes, or indeed just cover their eyes until the gas had blown over the trench. However, someone decided that liquid rich of ammonia could actually stop the gas getting into the respiratory system. And what is liquid rich of ammonia? It's urine. So what they did was they just took any material they could, like this old handkerchief or sock, anything, anything material that would soak up the urine. They'd usually have now by this point a communal bucket on the fire step where all the blokes would urinate into the bucket. As soon as the gas come over, they'd dunk it and then just put it over their face 
and just close their eyes until the gas came over. But now, instead of having to hold their breath or try and hold their breath, they can now breathe. Obviously, a handkerchief soaked in urine isn't really good enough. So the boffins very quickly came up with this. This is the black veil. So the black veil is, is what it says on the tin. It's actually made out of a veil material. And it actually goes over your face like a wedding veil. And inside, it's filled with cotton waste. Now this cotton waste would have an anti-gas ointment on there to actually stop the gas. So same thing as what the, as the handkerchief was doing, but now it's actually a proper chemical stopping it. However, unfortunately, the black veil doesn't work with tear gas. So with the use of tear gas and the black veil not being able to uh, be effective against it, they came up with these. These are spicer goggles. So every man would have been issued a set of these along with a new pad. So in conjunction, it would be a face pad with the spice of all. So now not only will the soldier be able to combat chlorine gas, he can also combat tear gas also. Also, some blokes would also get themselves rubberized goggles if they were lucky. These were generally motorcyclist goggles or motor goggles. Although the combination of goggles and a face pad was effective to a degree, the problem was it took a long time for a soldier to actually deploy it. So the boffins got working again and they came up with this. It's what is known as a hypo hood. It was soaked in a chemical called hyposulfate, so it gave it the name the hypo. It's made from a soldier's shirt and with a micra window. Now micra is a first generation plastic. So now a soldier can deploy his anti-gas equipment a lot more quickly and a lot more effectively. So now we've got eyepieces and a flutter valve. So the soldier would breathe in through his nose and out through his mouth. And inside the hood itself, he has a mouthpiece. So his teeth would grip over the mouthpiece to enable him to breathe through his nose and out through his mouth. And this would stop phosgene. However, it wasn't too good. They, they needed something else because phosgene, when we mixed with sweat, would start to irritate the skin. Then they came up with this. This is the pH hood. So, that, so pH stands for phenate hexamine. Okay, so that mixed together would stop the uh, irritation on the skin. Also, it was double layered as well. So there'd be a double layer of material inside the hood. However, throughout the war, you will see both hoods being used because once they were producing these ones, they needed to use them. So they did start soaking these in phenate hexamine as well. By mid-1915, it became clear that if there was no major assault by the end of that year, then they'd be consigned to another year and spending Christmas in the trenches. So the British, in conjunction with the French, decided to plan a major assault with the French at Artois and the British at Luz. The main assault went in on the 25th of September 1915 and preceding the main assault was a humongous artillery barrage along with one hour before zero hour, the release of gas along the British front line towards the Germans. At Luz, the British used gas for the first time. General orders stipulated that smoke hoods must be worn rolled up on top of the head, with the rear of the hood tucked into the collar. This was so that if the wind changed, the hoods could be deployed quickly. The preceding artillery barrage had failed to cut the German wire, and what made things even worse was that the gas now began to blow back towards the British lines. Second Lieutenant George Grossmith of the 3rd Battalion Leicestershire Regiment was present at Lewes in 1915. The gas hung in a thick pool over everything, and it was impossible to see more than 10 yards. In vain, I looked for the landmarks on the German line to guide me through the, to the right spot, but I couldn't see through the gas. By the 28th of September, the attack had ground to a halt and large portions of the British assault troops were back in their original starting positions. The British received casualties amounting to nearly 60,000, with the Germans just under 30,000, and this led to Sir John French resigning. The PH hood proved to be a very reliable piece of anti-gas equipment. However, the Germans had been starting to mix new gases together, which the PH hood couldn't withstand. 
After capturing German anti-gas equipment, they realised that the Germans were actually using filtered gas masks. And with a filter, it means you can combat a lot of different gases, which will make it universal. So we came up with this. This is the service box respirator. And we're very lucky, or well, I'm very lucky, to actually be holding an original. So it's very, very delicate. So the mouth, the face piece is made of a canvas. You've got glass eyepieces. So unlike the pH hood where you'd breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth, this design is you have a mouthpiece and you breathe in through your mouth and out through, and exhale through your mouth also. And through the exhale valve, which would have been on the bottom here, would work in the same way as what a hood did. Okay, it's exactly the same valve system. You've got a canvas tube, obviously the showing its age being over 100 years old, this would actually be uh, fully circular, but obviously through time it's perished and it's, it's deshapened itself. Then at the bottom, we've got the filter. Now the filter is very good because this actually makes it one of the best respirators of the war. Why? Because if the Germans came up with a new type of gas that needed a new type of filter inside the mask, all we had to do was recall the masks, replace the filter, and then everybody was happy. Unlike the German mask, where you'll see later in the war, is that their masks get a lot heavier. Because we're, remember, if they're mixing gases and throwing it at us, we're doing exactly the same to them. So you'll start seeing German soldiers in the very latter part of the wars with, them, with their respirators, but hanging very low down their faces because of the weight of the respirator. On the 20th of November 1917, the British launched an offensive like no other. It was to be a combined arms offensive. There would be no preliminary bombardment, so no artillery in the days leading up to the offensive, and total surprise would be achieved by the British assault in the German trenches. So the assault at Cambrai for the first time featured the mass use and deployment of tanks. Over 300 tanks in total took part in the battle. An absolute surprise was achieved by the British, which resulted in overwhelming success. Material fixed bayonets, fixed bayonets. The attack began at dawn on the 20th of November 1917, and a short, sharp artillery barrage lasting one hour preceded the assault. This included the firing of captured mustard gas shells. The infantry was supported by the Royal Flying Corps in the air and on the ground by the largest deployment of tanks so far in the war. Also used at Cambrai was this, a Livens projector, and these would lob gas canisters towards the enemy. On the first day alone, some units even managed to advance as far as five miles. At Cambrai, the British, for the first time, used mustard gas but they actually used captured German shells and used them against the Germans. And they used them in specific segments of the assault rather than as a whole sail blanket across the front line. Equipped with their small box respirators, the British were able to advance through the mustard gas. Whereas before the artillery had typically tried and failed to cut the wire, at Cambrai, the tanks played straight through it, creating avenues for the infantry to follow in their wake. However, all didn't go to plan for the British. The Germans launched two counter-offensives, one in the north and one in the south. And for both counter-offensives, they actually used mustard gas shells. At Cambrai, the British received 75,000 casualties. The Germans, 55,000. However, the offensive itself was an overwhelming success and it became the standard blueprint for all future offensives during the Great War. And the Germans, in 1940, copied the same style of tactics, which became known as Blitzkrieg. The first day of Cambrai was such a success that church bells rang out in Britain. However, for the participants, there was little cause for celebration. Mustard gas caused temporary, and in some cases permanent, blindness. Others paid the ultimate price. Lance Corporal Philip Dyke of the Royal Artillery was present at Cambrai. We were attacked with uh, mustard gas shells, and that was the first time I was ever hit. We had to walk, follow me leader, and I was uh, taken down to ruin. The nurses were absolute angels. They would say to me, you must stop coughing, 
and I'd say chance would be a fine thing. There was a E on my card, which meant I was going to England. But you don't feel too good anyway when you've just been blinded. I started to regain my sight because I only got fumes, whereas those that got the, uh, the liquid, they'd, uh, they'd be blinded. So laid out in front of me is the evolution of anti-gas equipment for the British soldier. And it goes to show what was going through their minds, as in the boffins, because this only took two years from urinating onto a handkerchief in 1915 to 1917, you have a very acceptable anti-gas equipment. That good, in fact, it was still in service all the way up until the 1930s when the Mark II respirator came into service. And even then, the general design of it was only differed very, very slightly because it was such a brilliant piece of technology. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode from Living History UK. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the YouTube channel where all the latest content will be available to you. Also, if you'd like to support what we do, you can also join us on Patreon where your funding will create more videos. So until next time, keep, keep history, history alive. alive.